we were interested in the diagnosis of what we call now ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Uh, it was already being talked about, but not well studied, back in the late 60s. And we started working with this disorder out of disbelief. We really didn't think it was going to respond to stimulant treatment that we had to see for ourselves. And so we started this studying the children, and indeed it was a real thing. When you looked for the children, they were there and they had a lot of handicaps. And we knew that since we were doing the work, the clinical work, very systematically, that it would be a resource to follow the children over time. Because what we had then were impressionistic reports of what happens to the children. And for the most part, clinicians were saying that this is a childhood condition and it goes away in adolescence. But nobody had proven it. So we started working with children in the early 70s with the expectation that it was important to know what happened to them over time. Parents want to know this, and rightly so. They should have access to this information. And two, we know in psychiatry, in child and adult psychiatry, that the long-term outcome, the long-term course of a condition is extremely important to know. It informs us on the ultimate significance or importance of the condition, and it tells us whether things get better, and in a way it confirms whether the diagnosis is something that's valid, that's objectively important, because it has predictive value. And so that's how it began. Then and we got very interesting and unexpected results. So after having done this when they were on average 18, we wanted to do it again after adolescence in early adulthood, and then they were 25. Now more recently, uh, together with a colleague, Dr. Castellanos, who is in the child psychiatry department at NYU, we decided that together we would try and follow these same children when they were 40 years of age because what happens in your 20s is not necessarily the same as what happens in your 40s or 30s. And no one had followed children with ADHD into their 30s and 40s before. And that was the background of our work. In addition, we wanted to be able to examine brain function. We knew that children with ADHD had brain anatomical differences. They had thinner cortex, a thinner cortex than ordinary kids. And no one knew of the time whether this was still true in adulthood. So the goal was twofold. One, to give more information about what happens to these kids in real life. How do they get along? How do they manage their work, their marriages, their children, etc. And two, do they still have different brain development from ordinary individuals? So that was the strategy we followed so all. The kids, the youngsters we followed had ADHD, but they did not have other behavior problems such as stealing, lying excessively, being cruel to animals, and it's hard to believe that there are six to 12 year olds who enjoy torturing cats, dogs, people, other children, who are aggressive, who will gang up with other kids to beat up at kids, who bully children. Those behaviors we could conduct problems. Our children did not have meaningful conduct problems. They might lie on occasion, all kids do, but they, weren't, they didn't have a pattern of this type of behavior. And that's important because what we found is that some of them did develop those patterns in adolescence. And that was 
And that was the only thing that was truly different in adolescence. And that, in turn, was sort of set up the stage for them to go on to drug abuse. But 17 years later, when they were 25, is that there were more of them who developed this, what we call antisocial pattern, where they break rules, where they are inconsiderate of the impact of their behavior on others and the environment, so they break in, entering, entering and break in, um, stealing, selling drugs, etc., and they develop substance abuse. That's a minority, but a large minority. Others do not. What we found in adolescence is that the ones who turned that way were the ones who still had ADHD. The one who no longer had, the ones, the children who got better, who didn't have the same problems with self-control, because it's a problem of self-regulation, did not have this bad outcome. So the challenge is to make sure that we can address the impulsive and inattentive behavior that characterize these children as they get into adolescence. Uh, in adulthood, what by that I mean at average age 41 and some are as old as 46, 47, we find a similar pattern but much less frequently. A lot of them get better. It's well known that adolescence is a very high risk period for boys. They do all sorts of crazy things, all sorts of da self damaging and damaging things to others. Behaviors that are impulsive, that show off, that are that are destructive, really, and um, we also know that that tends to get better as they grow. And it's true also of children with ADHD, that this type of misbehavior is reduced markedly, but it's still much more prevalent than it is in their peers, non-hyperactive peers. So there are continued disadvantages for about 20% of the children with ADHD as adults, but the others lead ordinary lives, and that's a good thing. I don't mean ordinary in a pejorative way or negative way. They are regular citizens, and so on the whole, the picture is not highly negative, but it's negative enough so that we know we have to do something to prevent it.